Hello, John Talley here with Partzilla.com. Our 2009 YFZ 450 Har has a bit of a problem. Out on the trail, sunk it in water, now she doesn't have compression. So, what do we need to do? Let's go ahead and get the plastics out of the way, get the fuel tank up and gone, pull the head and get down to that cylinder, because I bet it probably compressed down on the rings. That's what's causing it not to have compression. So, let me go grab my whole toolbox and we'll start doing this. So, let's go. All right guys, this portion of the project is only going to be a skill level two, but you still need to pay attention to everything because putting it back together, guess what? That is gonna be a three. Now I'm gonna go over all the tools you're gonna to need to either take it apart or put it back together. So let's go through it. On the ratchet side, as always, we're gonna have a three eighths and a quarter inch. You're gonna have various sockets associated with that, ranging from an eight up to a 17. The only oddball one is this thin walled 16. On the Allen side, you need to go all the way down to a three and up to this 14. On the extensions, you wanna have varying lengths to get in and around the engine. Just makes life simpler. The wrench side, really short, just a 10 and a 12. Decent set of side cutters, needle nose pliers, a couple of different pick tools. Always like having a uh, little magnet extension as well. Never hurts to have around. A couple of standard screwdrivers, flat blade and Phillips. And then you also wanna have a good breaker bar. You also want to have a good torque wrench because it's going to be definitely needed when we go to put everything back together. Now, if you would, reference our exploded parts diagrams. That's going to give you a very clear picture of how everything's going to come apart and more importantly, how it's going to go back together. So once you've got your tools and your parts together, we can go over there and I can walk you through it. So let's go. Step number one when you're about to do an engine job, disconnect your battery because as you're going through this, if you were to drop a wrench in the wrong place, it may make contact with the live section of your, your wiring, and we don't want that. So, what do we need to do? Well, we're gonna pull off all the plastics, we're gonna get the fuel tank out of the way, get the head off, and then get down to that cylinder. This hose may have pressure on it, so you wanna have a rag on it when you're pulling it off. As you're pulling this down, you wanna group all your nuts and bolts together, put them in little plastic bags, because it all seems simple right now, but if it takes you a couple of days before you have to put it back together, things start getting moved around, that's when you start losing pieces and parts, and it doesn't want to go back together correctly. All right, guys, we've got our plastics off, our fuel tanks out of the way. Let's go ahead and get the uh, radiator fluid drained out. Unfortunately, you can't tell how deep water is by looking at just the surface, and this one actually got submerged out on the trail. So, what does that mean? Well, we drained the water out of the top end, flushed out the crankcase, she still didn't want to start. Turns out it doesn't have hardly any compression on it. So, what happened? More than likely, we're going to find that the compression caused it to push down on the rings, and now they're no longer sealing the cylinder. All right, let's go ahead and get the muffler off and then we'll get the head pipe after that. Nothing to it, just a couple of 12s in the back, then a 10 millimeter up here. Go put this in our bag. The exhaust bolts up here are just 12 millimeters. Mm -mm. That bottom one's frozen on a little bit. We're gonna spray some penetrating oil on there. We're gonna let that soak for a few minutes. While it's doing its thing, we'll go ahead and work on the, uh, the intake side. All right guys, the way I'm gonna approach the intake is to go ahead and remove the air box itself. Next, we wanna pull the, uh, this breather box off the side, then disconnect the throttle body from the, uh, the intake boot on the side of the cylinder and just slide it back. That should get it out of the way enough for us to go ahead and remove the head and the cylinder. Now, we can loosen up the intake boot on the front side of the throttle body. There she goes. Now, let's see if the penetrating fluid has done its job. Eh, huh. You gotta love it when something works right. All right, let's go ahead and get our front radiator hose off. It's just a simple clamp. Once you pull that out of the way, you usually have to kind of break the seal, so to speak. So grab the rubber and just shake it a little bit. 
you hear it make this crunching sound, then you should be able to pull it back. Next, I want to go ahead and get the breather hose out of the way. It's got a couple of different points where it mounts to the head and down at the uh, side of the, uh, the crankcase. And then get one more clamp down at the bottom. That way we can just remove it. All right, guys, here's where Yamaha gets a little tricky. You know, this is a 16 millimeter or 5 8 socket, but if you just have a Craftsman one like I do, guess what? It's not going to go down in there. So, Motion Pro makes a thin wall spark plug remover, which we just happen to carry. So, you may want to pick up one of these. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to get down in there to pull it out. Hmm, it's wet. Imagine that. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and finish getting these cable harness holders out of the way. Go ahead and remove that, uh, that top motor mount. It actually has a 8 millimeter Allen on this side, 14 millimeter uh, nut on the other side. Once we get that bolt pulled through, then we'll pull these two top ones and that'll get the bracket out of the way. Yeah, it fooled me a little bit. I can see where it's got the nut on the side of the bracket, but it looks like it's actually welded on there. I would imagine that they did that so you could actually hold the threads because there was a fair amount of torque there and it, you know, it could shear away from the bracket potentially. All right, it looks like to get it to clear, I need to actually pull off the intake clamp because it was hitting it. There we go. So there's what I was talking about. They did weld a nut on the end of it. All right, now we can actually start bringing the engine apart. Let's uh, go ahead and get our valve cover off. I want to just go ahead and blow off any loose dirt because I don't want to drop anything down into it. And these are just two five millimeter Allens. Nice and clean in there. Our inspection covers over here at the crankshaft. The crankshaft bolt access actually has a 14 millimeter Allen and that way I can look at the cams and I want to bring it around to top dead center on the compression stroke. Don't lose your o-ring right here. All right guys what we're looking for here we want to turn this counterclockwise and there's going to be a mark to that outside edge. We want to bring it around to that little indention on the side of the case and then we want to verify that we are actually on the compression stroke by looking at our cams. So let's start bringing it around. See if we can find that mark. There it is, that's that single mark. All right, we've got our crankshaft around to top dead center, but if you look up at the cams, these two little indentions, they're on the inside, so that means we're on the intake stroke. And if you look at the, the actual lobes, they are pushing down on the valves. The, so it's actually sitting at split overlap. So we need to go another 180 degrees and that'll bring the cams around to the right position. There's the timing mark. There's top dead center. All right, now we've got a mark right there. Now, when you look at the, uh, the camshafts, those little indentions on the gears right here and here are even with the edge of the head. So we are on the compression stroke, top dead center. We can go and remove our tension adjuster for the cam chain. There's only two eight millimeter bolts. I'd do the inside one first because there's actually a spring that's pushing against it. So you can take it out by hand, and then the one on the outside, a little bit easier to get to. All right, there it is. Now we just need to bag it back up. A little bit of preparation now makes all the difference later. And one note, there was actually a crush washer on the inside bolt. So keep that in mind. Let's start pulling out our cam carrier or cam caps, and then that way we can lift off the, uh, the timing chain. And all of those are just eight millimeter bolts. All right, that should be everybody. Let's go ahead and lift them off. There's the exhaust and the intake. Now, got enough slack on our chain. Should just be able to walk them right out. Be careful of these little 
half shims right here. That's it. And these little half shims, see where they go in the bearing on the bottom? Like that. All right, let's go ahead and pull these eight millimeters on the side, and then we're gonna go after uh, those main bolts. All right, guys, these are 14 millimeter bolts, and I guarantee you they're gonna have some torque on them. And we wanna take them out about a quarter turn at a time, and we wanna go crisscross pattern to relieve the tension on the head. About 90 degrees, going back and forth. All right, now she's loose. We'll go ahead and remove these, but then we'll need to go back with a magnet to get the, uh, the washers. All right, at this point, I just want to get a small soft blow hammer, go ahead and break it loose, and the head should just lift right off. There it is, and she's off. All right, we're down to the cylinder now. Let's go ahead and get that front chain guide out of the way. It just lifts out. Now we can go ahead and get our head gasket out of the way. You go ahead and pitch it because we're not going to be reusing that. Now there's just one eight millimeter bolt over on this side, and then we can lift off the cylinder. There it is. Yep, look at them. They won't even move. They are stuck in there. That is what happens when you sink one of these machines. So. Once again, you can't always judge how deep that little water section is from the surface. The connect rod actually feels good. So what we want to do next is go ahead and get uh, a couple of cloths down inside. So I don't want to drop anything inside the, uh, the crankcase. Then we'll go ahead and get the, uh, the clips pulled on the uh, connector rod end. Then we can get that piston out of there. And for that, I'm just going to use a pick tool. And you've got one little edge on the piston where you can actually get up behind it. And then just guide it out. And there it is. All right, now we can go ahead and push it through. And she's off. Well, all right, guys, there it is. She's torn all the way down. Before we dive into this, I've been looking at the cylinder that came off of it. And it doesn't look to be in too terrible of condition. What you are looking for is you still want to be able to see the cross hatches in there. And I can still see remnants of it, but what you do not want to see are any marks that are vertical, because that means that they've been scoring in and erasing where those hatch marks are. Now, I could probably take this and just rehone it using a, a ball type hone, and it only takes a couple of swipes, because unlike older cylinders where you had an aluminum you know, casting and then you had a metal insert or a sleeve, this doesn't have that. It is raw aluminum that's been plated. I believe this one is uh, using Nicosil. So if you wear past that Nicosil when you're honing it out, it's game over. It's not going to seal and it's not going to do what it's supposed to do. So all that being said, I'm going to go ahead and replace mine. If you feel like you want to try honing yours to bring it back, go for it. But I'm telling you, be very careful and use a very fine grit, 320, 400, somewhere in that neighborhood. So let me go grab the, uh, the piston and then I'm going to show you how to place the, uh, the rings on it. What I typically do is go ahead and just mark on the top of the piston where each ring end gap should be. That makes it really easy when you're actually putting them together. All right, with this being the exhaust side facing forward, this is the intake side. What you want to do on your very top ring is come off 30 degrees off axis. So you want the top ring to end up here. All right, your second ring you want off axis almost 180 degrees from the top one. So it's going to be here. All right, next is going to be your upper oil ring, which is I'm going to mark here which is 30 degrees off axis. Then D is actually your oil expander ring. All right, it is gonna be another 15 to 20 degrees off of your top ring. So it's gonna end up there. And then E, which is your bottom oil ring, is gonna be 30 degrees off axis from the bottom here. 
All right, before we actually uh, put the wrist pin through there, let's go ahead and put one of our pin circlips in place. We'll do it on the outside. And what you're wanting to do is you want the end of the clip to end up down in this section. I think right about there it'll do. And let's just walk it in there. When you get this last little edge right here, make sure that you don't scratch the piston on the inside. There we go. It's pointing about right here, which is fine. I just don't want it over in this section. Now, let's go ahead and put some uh, oil inside where the wrist pin is going to go. Now, with that done, we can go ahead and carry the, uh, the piston over, get it connected to the connector rod. All right, at this point, you want to make sure you still got your towels in place here because we're about to put in the other circlip and you do not want it to fall into the bottom of your engine should you miss. Before we actually put the rings on, let's go ahead and get our dowels in place as well as that cylinder base gasket. Be careful not to push your piston around too much and get it scarred up. Let's get that lower gasket on. There she goes. Now, let's go ahead and start getting our rings on. We want to start with an oil ring expander, which is going to be D. Take a little bit of oil and you just want to wet it all the way around. Just a light coat. When you're putting this on, you want to make sure that the ends actually butt together. You do not want them to overlap like that. That should do it. Next we can go for that lower ring, which is going to be E. But I want to keep my finger on the end of that oil ring so they don't jump out. It's okay to do what I call spiral these on, but you don't want to use this technique with the top two rings. I'll explain that in a few minutes. So we're going to put that there and then gently spiral it around to that lower ring position like that. Now we're going to bring the upper oil ring over to C. All right, so our oil ring is now together. Feels nice and even all the way around. All right, guys, we got two rings left. Um, the darker of the two is going to be your second ring, and then the shinier one is going to be the top. The top one is thicker than the second, so it wouldn't go in that middle section anyway. But what you do want to notice is there is a T stamped on each one. We want to make sure that faces up. Just take a little dab of oil, coat it all the way around. This is going to be our B ring. And when you're doing this, you want to pull it out evenly and don't let it bend one way or another and then drop it in. There it is. Let's bring it around to B without disturbing the oil ring. Same thing for the top ring, A. Make sure you've got your T facing up. Put a thin layer of oil all the way around it. Now we're going to turn it, make sure it doesn't bother the other ring, and bring it around to A. Now I'll take a little bit more oil and put it on the skirts on either side of the piston. Now, it doesn't matter if you're installing a new cylinder or one that you just honed, but you want to make very, very sure that you get this clean. So what I'm going to do, spray it down, a little bit of uh, parts cleaner. and then get all of that wiped out. Just want to make sure there's no deposits. When they ship them out, they typically have a coating in there. So I bet you when I pull this out, it's going to have some of that sediment on there. And it does. See, that we did not want on our brand new piston and rings. So with that cleaned up, let's go ahead and get some oil in the cylinder. Just a light coating because we actually do want the rings to bite into the surface so that they seat properly. All right, let's see if we can get our cylinder back on. What we're gonna do is pass this magnet through, pick up the chain, hold it out of the way as we bring the cylinder down on it. Push our piston rings in from either side, one at a time, and then kind of walk the cylinder down on it. It's just a matter of me getting everything in the right position and walking it down like that. There we go. Now, lift up our chain, 
finish walking it down. All right, with that in place, let's go ahead and put in that single bolt over here. You want to be careful here if your machine is still dirty, but you don't want to knock anything off of the, uh, the frame rails or this cross member that may have dirt on it, and then it fall in the engine. And that bolt's going to be torqued to seven foot pounds. Now, let's go ahead and put in our chain guide. My front one was a little bit worn, so I decided to go ahead and replace it. Put a little bit of oil, the length of it. Lift up our chain and go ahead and get her in place. Now, let's go ahead and get our dowel pins pushed in and then we can put in our uh, head gasket. All right, she's in place. Now, let's go ahead and uh, bring the head down and we're gonna bring the chain up through. Now, I've already taken some of that parts cleaner and just a really soft brush and cleaned out the combustion chamber. It's ready to go. I have not disturbed where my valve tappets and more importantly the shims were when it was taken apart. So they're going to be going back in the same uh, location. But just in case one of them or two of them fell out, I went ahead and numbered them. That was just a precaution. And it looks like she's sitting flush. Let's go ahead and get these other two eight millimeters on this side in place. Same uh, seven foot pounds. And then we'll uh, put in the head bolts, get those torque down. All right, guys, Yamaha has an interesting torque sequence for this particular model. What we're going to do is put a little bit of grease, now that I've got the bolts cleaned up, around this washer. Remember, that's just on the washers. That's the only place we want it. We're going to drop all four of them in. And we're going to take them down in a sequence to 22 foot-pounds. The sequence is one, two, three, and four. At that point, I'm going to relieve tension, make them loose again. Two, three, and four. Then take them back down in the same sequence to 14 foot pounds. Two, three, and four. And at that point, we do the sequence again, but we're going to turn them 90 degrees. Here is where if you either need a degree wheel or to mark your your bolts with just a black marker. This particular torque wrench I have, it actually calculates angles. So I'm gonna use it to do it. And then when we're done with that, we're gonna do the same sequence one more time, 90 degrees. Interesting concept, huh? All right, with all that jostling around, I guarantee you that our crankshaft is no longer at top dead center. So let's get that reset, leave a wrench on it, keep it in place, hold it still, and then we'll start working on the cam timing. It was maybe two or three degrees off. All right, we're just gonna leave that hanging right there. So now let's go ahead and coat both the, uh, the buckets and the, uh, the surfaces that the cam rides on with a little bit of assembly lube, and then we're gonna carry the cams over. Tell you what, let's add a little bit more, at least to the lobes, because I do not want this thing starving at first start. All right, if you were watching the video when we took it apart, the way we want these to end up, the lobes to be facing up, and this little divot right here is gonna be even with the edge of the top of the head. Not this one, the one down here. This is gonna signify that you are at the top dead center of the compression stroke. Same thing over here. The divot that you're gonna to want to be in line is that one right there. So when we get them in this position, it's gonna be timed correctly. All right, let's start wiggling them in there. We'll start with the exhaust first, because it actually pulls against the front of the engine, which is the fixed chain guide. That's looking good. Let's verify it down in the crankshaft. Make sure we're still on our mark. Remember it's the single mark, not the double. Yep, we are there. So this is what we were looking for, like I showed you on the bench. Dot, dot, and the lobes are up. So, a little bit more assembly lube. Let's go and get those caps on. Clip, put it in that little groove on the bearing. 
go ahead and do the exhaust first. That feels right. Let's go ahead and do the intake as well. All right, that's in place. Got our dowels lined up. It's holding on to that clip. Timing still looks good. Let's go ahead and get these bolts in. May want to put a little bit of oil on the threads. We're going to take these to seven foot pounds. One, two, three, four. And this one's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. Yep, we're good. All right, next, let's get our uh, chain tensioner ready to go. What we have here is you remove this bolt, get it out of the way. Got our new gasket that's going to be going in. And you'll notice there are two bolts that you took out. And I hope you paid attention because if the engine is facing this direction, the inside bolt is the one with this little copper washer. The one on the outside doesn't have one. Once you've got that in place and ready to go, we need to go ahead and reset the tensioner because you can't push it back in right now. The reason for taking out that bolt is take a flat blade screwdriver and then we want to screw it all the way back in and it'll have a small section where it'll latch. But even so much as breathe on it and it's gonna pop loose. Other thing you wanna make sure of, there's a little stamp right here that says up. So of course we want that facing up. So we've got our outside bolt, we've got our inside bolt, we've got our new washer. Try not to bump anything. And now we're gonna go mount it to the bike. I feel like I'm carrying a bomb over here. <laughs> Once we get at least one of these mounting bolts all the way down without it releasing, we've won the battle. Screw it all the way down. And then we're gonna reach in there and just tap that bolt on the inside or that adjustment screw on the inside and that'll release the tension and it's gonna push against the chain. Last but not least, don't forget this little uh, end cap bolt. All right, let's get our valve cover ready to roll. We're putting in a new gasket and we are also replacing these two washers that are up top because they're all made out of rubber. And rubber, as you know, after a while gets hard and then it you know, cracks and then fails. Notice that this piece right here, we actually need to cut it out. It is not supposed to stay on there. And what Yamaha also wants you to do is use a thin layer of Yamaha 1215 or equivalent all the way around on this surface. And then once we set that in there, then we're going to put it on the lobes that go down to the head on the other surface. So we're just going to put a thin layer. It's not going to take much. Now, let's go ahead and set this in place. Now we're going to go over these two half moons. All right, we're all gooped up. Let's get her uh, back in there. And now we've got our two new little washer slash seals going up top. Tighten these down till they bottom out. You'll feel it when it bottoms. There. All right, next, let's go ahead and get our um, crankshaft cover and that inspection hole for the timing. And make sure that you're not missing your uh, O-rings on either one. All right, the small one's a six. And the larger one is a 14. Now let's get that spark plug in. I want to give you a little bit of advice that I've gotten mainly from the personal watercraft world. These spark plugs are notoriously thin where the threads go into the base of the spark plug. And this one came out, but I want you to look at all the corrosion on there that was starting to build up. Now what was in danger of happening? Snap. Threads stay in, top part comes out then guess what? You're having to pull this all the way apart. So long story short, I always put a little bit of anti-seize on the threads before I put them in there. And also remember, you have to have a thin wall 16 to get down into the head to tighten it back down. And now we want to torque that to nine foot pounds. Well, all right, guys, that 
pretty much finishes up the top end engine build, but there's still a lot left to do. What all is going to be entailed? Well, we're going to be dealing with the intake, the exhaust, the cooling system, getting it refilled with oil, get the gas tank back on it, and get all the plastics put back together, and then fire it up for the first time. All right, guys, when we left off, I had just installed the spark plug. Now, we just need to finish that off by putting in the spark plug cap. From there, we're going to connect our radiator lines up to the top of the engine and its associated clamp. All right, let's get this front cable bracket on. Next, let's go ahead and do the uh, upper engine mount because you still need some room to wiggle around there and I don't want to do the intake before this goes in place. The trick with this bracket is to get it in place and start your upper bolts and then put the bolt through that goes actually through the head. All right, so we've got our upper head mount bolt in place. We can just snug these down and then we'll torque them here in a couple of minutes. All right, before we put this, uh, this cover on, what I wanna do is just rotate it over one time to make sure I don't have any interference. Yeah, there's your compression. So we're good to go. All right, our top two bolts are 24 foot pounds and then that eight millimeter Allen's gonna be 29. All right, with that bracket in place, we can go ahead and get on our breather hose that goes to the valve cover. Snake this around and then get this line attached like so. And you got a couple of five millimeter Allen's one on the side right here. Then go and start the one on the front and get those snug down. All right guys, let's go ahead and take care of getting the intake put on to the throttle body. And wanna take note of the clamp has this little indentation up at the top. There'll be a corresponding section of the intake boot where that needs to slide on. All right, next, need to get the uh, throttle body pushed in and I usually use a little bit of parts cleaner to spray down on the front edge that makes it easier for it to go in. There she goes and then there's a four millimeter Allen that you need to tighten back down on the clamp. Next we want to bring in the air box wiggle it onto the uh, the back side of the throttle body and then get it bolted in place. Same trick as before, wet the intake boot. All right, I've got her down and into place, but now we gotta make sure that we push it forward to get the boot up onto the uh, throttle body. That should be it. Now we can reach in there and tighten that rear clamp. All right, let's get these two bolts on the back of the air box. Then we're gonna drop down to the side where this little breather adapter box mounts to the air box and then there's just a single 10 millimeter bolt that goes in. All right we're going to go ahead and get at least two of these bolts in for this bracket. There's a piece of the bodywork that actually gets sandwiched in there. So we'll leave these other two bolts out for the time being. Then we're going to move on to the exhaust system. Going to do the head pipe first then the muffler. My gasket, the copper one that goes up inside the head, it actually looks okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, torque it back down, but if it leaks, man, I'll just pull it back off later and replace it. And when you're putting this piece on, you just want to get it in place and just start these two 12 millimeter bolts, but don't tighten it down yet because we need to go ahead and shimmy the muffler on there to get it to line up right because there's a whole lot of play here. And the chances of you guessing exactly which angle it's going to be, ah, pretty much about zero. All right, with both of those at least started, now we can go ahead and tighten the two exhaust bolts. Get this junction right here. And then the muffler mount bolts. 
Next, we need to get in that little tray that goes below the fuel tank. Just lays in there like that. Next, let's lay in our fuel tank. Drop it down, just shimmy it forward. Just one bolt back at the back. Reconnect our fuel line. And then push that down. Connect up the power. And now let's go ahead and fill our cooling system. Before I can fill it, I need to replace the drain bolt, which is right down here. And now that's in place, we can go ahead and start refilling it. Its total capacity should be around 1.3 quarts. We've put in one and it's pretty much up to the top. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and top off the reservoir down here, put the cap on, and then we're gonna do our first start. Let it idle for a couple of minutes, then we'll come back and check it. So I was getting ready to fill up the reservoir for the radiator and that fluid's looking a little rough. So I'm gonna use this uh, brake bleed Mighty Vac, pull out the fluid that was in there and refill it with some fresh coolant. Now, let's go ahead and get it refilled. There we go. Get our line back in there. All right, let's get our radiator cut back on. Let's go ahead and connect up that battery, crank it up, let it idle for about a minute, and then I want to check the level on that radiator fluid. Just repriming the fuel system. That should be it. The moment of truth. Here we go. All right, guys, for an initial startup, that sounded pretty good. I went back and I checked the oil level. That's looking good added a little bit more coolant. What I want to do next is go ahead and open up this uh, building to where we can actually let it idle without killing ourselves, get out a fan, get some air going in front of it, and let it idle coming up to temperature. That's going to take in between five and six minutes, somewhere in that neighborhood. And we're going to be watching it the whole time, make sure there's no leaks, no weird sounds, and just let it come up to temp. What I'm doing right now is using a digital thermometer. And if you don't have one of these devices, just let it idle until the fan comes on, providing, of course, that yours works. Once it's done that, you've completed the first heat cycle. Just at an idle, then we're gonna shut it off. Well, all right, guys, that was her first heat cycle. Everything's sounding really good. Once it's cooled down, you wanna check your levels just one more time at the radiator, down at your reservoir, and then check your oil. Crank it up one more time, let it idle a few seconds, and then check your level. Well, everything's checked out, so it's time to get the plastics on. Well, all right, guys, that wraps this one up. The only thing I have to do now is take it out and break it in. I typically run them about 45 minutes to an hour, never opening up the throttle all the way and varying my speed a bunch. Well, listen, if you need any parts for your machine, why don't you come see us at partzilla.com and we can get you taken care of. Have any questions or comments? Leave them in the section below and I'll do my best to answer them. We just want to say thanks for shopping here with us at Partzilla. And if you like what you see, why don't you go ahead and subscribe to our channel? That way you can see what I'm up to next. Listen, again, we want to say thanks for watching and we will see you in the next video. Have a great day.